Call to order the Lynchburg Planning Commission meeting for Wednesday, September 14th, 2022. And our first order of business is the approval of the July 27th, 2022 minutes. Has everybody had a chance to look them over? And are there any questions or changes? Could we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Next order of business is the following new business. We will consider adopting the Deerington Neighborhood Plan as part of the city's comprehensive plan 2013 to 2030. The plan proposes significant investment in Jefferson Park, including a neighborhood patio with a pavilion and splash pad on the former tennis courts, a multi-use gymnasium, marking the Jefferson Park pool site, numerous park trails and access improvements, and enhancements to many recreational facilities. Neighborhood recommendations include improving streets with pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure to improve active transportation and calm traffic, gateway improvements to Chamber Street and Caroline Street, and redeveloping the city storage site at 200 Pulaski Street. Future planning efforts chapter includes recommendations for housing sidewalks, changes to the future land use map, and zoning ordinance that will be proposed for adoption at a later date. So, Rachel, I believe you're presenting this. Great. Thank you, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, the Deerington Neighborhood Plan has been in progress for about three years now, kicking off way back in 2019. Uh, the majority of the work here was done by city staff, namely Ms. Ann Nygaard, in addition to the other members of our urban design team at the city. Uh, but it was also guided by the neighborhood and the steering committee. Hill Studio helped provide some of the illustrations to visualize the plan concepts and UVA School of Architecture professor Elgin Cleckley helped lead the design thinking workshop. So here's what we're gonna go over with you today. Um, we'll do a quick neighborhood overview just to make sure we all know what and where Darrington is and a piece of its history. We'll quickly go over our process, talk about some of the contents of the plan and recommendations. Um, there's more to it, but uh, in the essence of time, um, we'll, we'll hit the high points. And then we'll talk about next steps. Um, so where is Darrington? Um, to orient you, this is Memorial Avenue to the south um, and Langern Road. Uh, Rachel, that's not showing up uh -oh. on the map there. Um, can we get the... Oh. Uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> well, I guess this is it. <laughs> just imagine how bad it would be if you were running it. Am I too loud? Oh. There it is. Sorry about that. So again, uh, Memorial Avenue and Langer and Road are the major boundaries of the neighborhood. This is E.C. Glass High School and Lynchburg General Hospital to the north. Uh, this boundary along the Blackwater Creek Trail is uh, very steep slopes. Um, within the neighborhood, the major landmarks are Deerington Elementary School, the Deerington Apartments, and Jefferson Park. An important piece of neighborhood history is pictured here on this slide. Um, and that is that Jefferson Park historically was home to one of the only, or the only city pool open to African Americans during the area of segregation. And when the city chose to close all the pools rather than to desegregate, it was filled and sadly used as a landfill. Despite this history, Jefferson Park has been and is considered a place of great joy for Darrington. And this story is just a part of Darrington's history but it ties into some of the recommendations that we'll be discussing later. <laughs> when we decided to uh, set out with this plan, doing it mainly in-house, meaning mostly relying on city staff, um, we laid out a process graphically to give ourselves a game plan. The first step was to get organized. And that means define the area, set the schedule, uh, set up a website, and begin to understand the neighborhood concerns and interests. The next step was to learn by doing some data analysis, researching neighborhood history, meeting with the neighborhood and listening, and then using that to establish our vision and goals. 
We next moved into the create phase where we started to brainstorm solutions and strategies and bounce ideas off with the neighborhood members. We finalized those by synthesizing everything, putting it on paper and compiling it into a single document and setting priorities. This gives us that the plan that we're talking about today. And of course, once the plan is adopted, the work isn't over. Um, we'll next be looking to implement some of the recommendations. The pandemic did make us change things a bit uh, and stick in certain phases longer than we intended to, um, but we did our best to, to follow the plan that we set out uh, to follow originally. Our neighborhood engagement consisted of working with the steering committee throughout the process, um, and that included residents, former resi residents, key stakeholders from institutions such as the elementary school and LRHA. A neighborhood kickoff open house was held in December 2019, where we had resource tables for the public, as well as interactive ways to record input on various topics. There was also an online and paper survey distributed, um, and staff also attended the neighborhood center reopening in early 2020 to try to push those survey responses. A design thinking wor workshop was held outdoors on the tennis courts at Jefferson Park um, in October 2020. This led to many of the uh, plan recommendations. Following the initial release of the plan in spring 2021, an interactive website was set up where people could recommend and respond um, to plan concepts. And most recently, a neighborhood meeting was held on August 11th that I know a few planning commissioners were able to attend to review the plan and collect feedback. That public engagement led us to this vision. Uh, the vision and goals were based on the feedback from the outdoor workshop and edited after reviewing with the steering committee. The big goals are to improve transportation options, transform vacant land, remember, remember the history of the place, make the park a unifying feature, and to make it a premier park within the city as it used to be, take advantage of topography, and to also increase accessibility. And so I'm not reading these word for word, and I don't intend to gloss over them, they're very important, but the key takeaway here is that we developed this vision with the neighborhood and we have translated that vision into these goals to help us to, to achieve it. So this is the proposed Jefferson Park. Um, it's really a, a centerpiece of the neighborhood and accordingly um, should be a, a centerpiece of the plan. The overall vision emphasizes park activity at this corner, which is Chambers and Kirby Streets. Um, this is currently where the tennis courts are, if you're familiar. It's accessible at the street level. It's closest to the neighborhood and will also allow us to create a dynamic park space that serves a number of uses. We also want to drastically improve the number of routes into and within the park for exercise, including adding an accessible route down from Kirby Street, which is this zigzaggy path you see here. Uh, this is something that we're designing now and looking for grant funding on. The plan shows a gymnasium being built into the park. Uh, this recommendation responds to what we heard at the outdoor workshop, and that's that the neighborhood wants Jefferson Park to be the premier park it once was, and also responds to the parks department's need for gymnasium space. It's designed so that it's set into the hillside on York Street so as to not overwhelm the adjacent houses. It also features structured parking below the gymnasium and fitness space. The neighborhood patio is, is back at that corner we talked about of Chambers and Kirby, uh, where the tennis courts are. This was identified as a key location that could be transformed to better serve the neighborhood. And we hope to take a two-step approach here so that progress could start sooner than later. The short-term plan includes using low-cost materials to create a valuable public space. The pavilion that you see here is being designed now and will have charging capabilities and Wi-Fi. Um, you can see some of the other proposed features in the illustration. The 10-year design for the patio includes a splash pad, which is significant because um, it, it brings back that water to the site, um, like we talked about with the pool earlier. Um, the facility will be both the active and playful kind of space, and also contain a more passive reflective space to recommend or to 
remember and acknowledge the, the history of the park itself. The patio design should direct people to look out, not only at the great view of the park, but also towards the site of the historic pool, which can be seen in the distance. Um, but the pool doesn't really look like much at this point, so it needs to be marked. The plan suggests using a low-cost, bright material called survey whiskers, which is shown on the, on the slide here, um, to make it visible and also to put some signage at the patio to describe what people are seeing and the history of what happened there. Longer term, as more research is done on the landfill site, we'd like to find a more permanent way to remember the pool so that it's not forgotten. Looking out from the patio but closer in is the new basketball court. The plan proposed removing the court to the amphitheater and bringing the amphitheater back to life, kind of giving it more defined purpose. Um, you can see here prior to the new basketball court, it really wasn't looking at anything. Um, even though there used to be a, a baseball diamond, um, it was sort of underutilized up till now. So the, um, the basketball court was just completed this summer through CDBG funding. Um, if you haven't had a chance to visit it, it's, uh, it's really neat to see, very colorful and bright, and every time I go out there, I see someone using it, which is awesome. Moving out of Jefferson Park and talking a little bit about the neighborhood, which is the context for this great park. Um, currently, the only trail access is uh, an earthen trail through Jefferson Park, but Kemper Street Trail, which connects to downtown, is paved and run right, runs right next to the neighborhood. The plan proposes a paved trail connection at, at the Chamber Street Gateway, which we'll talk about next. Other off-street trails include restoring a trail that once went to nearby Tenbridge Hill, as well as connecting to Lynchburg General Hospital. The plan also suggests prioritizing um, creating loops and connecting major destinations with a number of on-street trails that can come in different forms. Page Street is shown here and is one of those recommended on-street trails. It's an ambulance route and the primary route to the hospital campus for the neighborhood and is in need of bike and pedestrian improvements. The Chamber Street Gateway uh, is located right off Fifth Street, where Fifth Street turns into Memorial after the bridge. Um, the city gas pumps are here, if you're familiar. Go down the big hill and you're in Darrington. This is one of two key gateways, and this is also where the Kemper Street Trail can be tied in through the city uh, public works site um, and existing access road. The plan shows a number of improvements here, including dealing with stormwater runoff and neighborhood aesthetics by pulling the chain link fence off the road and also installing some landscaping. The last chapter of the plan focuses on future planning efforts. The pandemic forced us to really focus on parks and public assets primarily. Um, other topics have been included in the final chapter and should receive more public input as they move forward. The big items being recommendations for including public transportation stops and routes, prioritizing streets for sidewalk improvements, and taking a closer look at our future land use map in the neighborhood, which we anticipate we will do with our comprehensive plan update starting this winter. A major suggestion for increasing, increasing housing and blending with the Darrington apartments is to consider allowing row houses in our three zoning districts where duplexes are currently allowed by right. We have a housing study going on right now looking into the feasibility of this sort of development. Um, once that is complete, it would be uh, an appendix to this plan document. So uh, the next steps following adoption would be to work on including these projects in the city's capital improvements program and identifying applicable grants. Uh, meanwhile, we'll continue work on our current CDBG grant, um, like with the basketball court that we've already completed. These improvements are nearing the end of their design phase. Um, so where we will hopefully should be in the next year, um, you should see the interim patio as well as the pavilion uh, a small loop trail around the basketball court area, athletic lighting for the basketball court and amphitheater improvements, and the design of the ADA access from Kirby Street um, construction, depending on further funding. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions after any public comments.
Thank you, Rachel. So at this point, I'd like to open this up for any public comments. And we have a couple of people in attendance. And I don't know if we have anything emailed. Because we're, we're open to, to hearing from people. But if not, we can go on ahead and close the public hearing and address any questions to Rachel. Could you talk a little bit more about the gym? That seems to be a, an odd addition to a park, right? There's nothing like that. And you mentioned that anywhere else in the city. Uh, right, and there's, there's definitely a need for it. Um, that, that's coming from our Parks and Recreation Department. We don't really have dedicated gym space other than sharing with schools and the city armory. Um, so there's, there's limitations there with um, you know, the amount of overlap with other organizations using those same spaces. Um, and that was something that their neighborhood wanted to see based on the outdoor, the tennis court workshop. Um, Again, just making Jefferson Park sort of a, a destination premier park that that it once was, something, something special. So would it be like a, a mini Y? Would it be an indoor basketball court? What, what um, would it Well, contain? so basketball is definitely the most popular use in the park. Um, you know, I think the specifics of what exactly the gym houses, um, you know, we'd, we'd want to see more more conversations with the neighborhood going forward. Um, the parking is key because if you're going to create something that draws people to the neighborhood, you got to have a place to put them. Um, but you know how exactly we allocate the space inside. Um, there was mention of you know fitness equipment, so it, it could be something like a, a mini Y. There's also some fitness features um, in the park itself with that neighborhood patio. Um, so that was definitely something that was that was on the neighborhood's radar as uh, something they'd like to see is uh, fit, fitness options. And so that would be open to anyone in the city. Uh, yes. It, it just seems like that's a very high ticket item. That I, I think it would need a lot of exploration to justify oh, that cost. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, almost all the recommendations. I mean, we're. we're these are these are concepts, and of course, um, that, you know. That's the only physical indoor structure, though. That's got to be at the top of the list when it comes to pricing. Right, and and I think we're talking about um, you know adding something that is a, a citywide asset as well as you know a neighborhood asset. So, you know. My thought was that it was going to be a basketball gym simply because we don't have enough, um, and then. Secondarily, let's talk about it for a second. You were talking about that space in front of the amphitheater. Mm -hmm. I was almost wondering about having that be a, a field that might be used for football or lacrosse or soccer or whatever else. Again, um, but that's all predicated on, on what I heard your comment was at the request of, of Parks and Rec. And so, you know, I just I glommed onto that thinking that Parks and Rec was driving both the gymnasium and then. I was just going to throw that other idea in on the field just simply because I've been there. I know that not any of them. Um, we talked about it and we talked about humankind. But anyway, is that incorrect? Is, 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 is that, a, is that a, a, a resident driven request to have the gymnasium? Um, it's both. Both. It's both. Right. Yes. Um, so the plan specifically uh, talks about approximately 200 <clears throat> parking spaces. Um, classrooms in the spaces fronting the park, a fitness center, and a basketball gymnasium on the top floor. So what would the field be used for? Uh, the field has has a little bit of, I mean, it's got a bank, so a berm bank, so that's for spectators, I assume. But you say it used to be a, bas a baseball field. And so what's so planned? What's planned for that now? Like there's space for anything. So the, the basketball court, this is here now. Awesome. Yeah, that was that was completed this summer, um, and again that was to kind of give the amphitheater a purpose. Um, because yeah, you the, said that, and I was mm -hmm. I misunderstood. I misunderstood. But I mean, there's still plenty of of open space in the park um, for other 
Well, I like the idea of having multi-use, you know, from the you know, outside around the track as well, to have fitness stuff around the track. I've been in places where we've had that before, and I thought it was I thought it was nice, and it was always pretty much used. And then the area for the spray garden and whatever whatever you call that area that used to be a tennis court, right? Or is a tennis it's, court? It's a tennis court now. Um, the, used. It yes, that's that's what we've heard from the neighborhood. Um, in the uh, exercise with the dots, the the most used parts of the park, no one put a dot on. There. No one put a dot on the tennis court. Oh. Um, however, you know, if that is something that um, the neighborhood is concerned with, if, you know, if people are using it and we're unaware, um, that is also mentioned as a possible use on the city materials storage site, um, which is uh, essentially a place in the neighborhood where the city keeps bricks and stones and literally material storage. Um, you know, we have to find another place to put those if we want to move it out of there, but it's not really a particularly neighborhood friendly use. Um, and so the t uh, tennis courts over there could be um, a better use of that space since it's a more specific um, place you would, you could go there and do it rather than having that sort of prime space oh. right there as a neighborhood entry into the park. That would be the patio more of a multi, you know, you've got the passive, um, the history, the reflection components on that patio. Um, and if the neighborhood wanted, so, you know, we could potentially look at tennis courts on another site. So you're talking about the material storage site, which is over near the railroad track, right? It's like um, off Pulaski Street, yes. Okay. I don't know if I have a graphic that shows it. maps the proposed trail maps mm -hmm. so the yellow it says this is an on-street facility is that a separated paved a bike path like we have on Oddfellows Road or is that just a delineated lane um, so it most likely would be a sidewalk um, we call it a an on-street trail when it's a part of a bigger sort of recreation loop, um, but it, in, in reality, it may end up looking like a sidewalk. It does allow bikes. Like I think our city code doesn't allow bikes on sidewalks. Uh, I believe you're right. Um, so that's that's kind of what we talk about in the, um, the future planning chapter, mm -hmm. um, you know, figuring out where we have the right of way and the pavement width to do, you know, separated bike, mm -hmm. uh, lanes versus sidewalks versus some combination um, the you know the plan is speaking to the fact that something needs to be there for traffic other than vehicular you know right. pedestrian or bike mm -hmm. would you put the plan in dropbox or or is it online or uh, yeah Anna will put it in dropbox now if it's <coughs> not there but it, it is also on the um, planning commission page if you're looking to get to it right away Nancy okay no, I don't need it right this minute. Okay. Um, I had a question about the um, proposed um, uh, row house concept. Mm -hmm. um, so you're planning to change the, the not the zoning, but the, well, the overlay or something to allow row houses in some parts of it, right? And then it would be up to the private sector to build them that's correct. Uh, the housing study is um, that we're that we're working on now, um, and hopefully should wrap up before the end of the year, um, is looking at how exactly we could and sh if we should go about doing that. Um, I, I think the plan makes an important distinction between row houses and townhouses, and a lot of it has to do with how it fits within the neighborhood and um, kind of interacts with the street. You know, you don't really want a big parking lot separating it. You don't want it's separate from the neighborhood. It needs to be sort of integrated. Um, and so when we started looking at what would it take to create a row house use in our zoning district, you know, we found it was is very nuanced as to what is what a row house is versus a townhouse. Um, and so yes, ultimately, it 
would largely be up to the, the private sector. Okay, thanks. And also determining, you know, what zoning districts, if it should be an overlay, if it should be by right, you know, what should the minimum size be, that sort of thing. Okay. <clears throat> this might be a dumb question, but if, like, if this passes like beyond city council, um, and it and it is adopted, and it so it's it it's still a concept, or does it like f where does it go from there? I mean, so and and how do they <clears throat> decipher when the funding, you know, especially for the gym, Nazi? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I saw that you you have four things that are probably the first the first things that would be dealt with, but then how, how, did, how does the big picture happen? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, how, do we, how do we implement, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the, the first step is to adopt the plan um, because, you know, without a document saying, you know, this is, this is where we should, we should go with this neighborhood, um, you know, it's really hard to get grants <laughs> if you don't have a plan a saying plan, that, sure. um, that this is appropriate. Um, in order to la to leverage, you know, any kind of state funding or, you know, even federal, if it if it if we were able to do that, um, you've got to have something saying this is part of our comp plan. This is, you know, affirmed by planning commission and council. The neighborhood wants it. That sort of thing. Um, so so adoption is of course the first step, um, and from there, you know, the CIP process. Uh, you just got to work it in where we can, um, you know, in determining <laughs> priorities um, with things that are already going on in the capital improvements plan. And I know Tom has done a lot of work um, on the CIP. If his mic is working. <laughs> so. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so the way we have been doing it the past. Uh, at least two years as we came up with a CIP prioritization uh, document and um, set out a series of strategies to essentially rank projects. So if this plan is adopted, those projects would go in the mix and depending on uh, how they, they rank on things like environmental impact, uh, you know, improving the transportation network, social equity, there's, you know, alternative funding sources, depending on how it scores, uh, depends on where it gets placed in the CIP. So it's kind of a, <clears throat> it's a technical way of evaluating all CIP projects. Um, so that's kind of how it would play out. I'm just curious, like how, do you, do you have many adopted plans that never come to fruition or that have been on the on the list for years that just haven't made it to the top of the priority I was just curious well yeah so I, I think a good example might be the Campbell Avenue Oddfellows plan although part of that plan was implemented with the Oddfellow, Oddfellows Road improvements but um, you know without the plan there is no chance of right. you know doing anything to, to change an area because you really don't know what to do you're, you're kind of floundering so um, the plan is the most important first step mm -hmm. and then trying to have a champion somebody that's going to champion the plan which if you look at Timbridge Hill there is a great example of how the friends of Timbridge Hill have championed that plan yeah. uh, so once it's adopted we start working the funding sources and, and trying to get it implemented. Mm -hmm. Again, I've said this many times, implementing these plans is not a race, it's a marathon. So just trying to not get tunnel vision and implement a piece at the time, that's what's important. We've had a number of these plans come through, you know, it seems like recently. And I would assume that the first step would be to have, make sure that the new comprehensive plan reflects all of the findings of, of these plans, because they're, they're, you know, obviously there's still some changes. There's still changes to the downtown plan, to your point, that hadn't been fully implemented. But then to, to the, when you hit the um, capital improvement plan, it would seem to me 
just like you've laid this one out, Rachel, we're not doing everything at the same time. So it may be number one priority here, but we're going to get number three priority on this particular plan. I mean, so we're doing that kind of work, right? Well, we're doing a lot of work. So it, it's important to kind of understand how the comprehensive plan and these neighborhood plans work, right? So the comprehensive plan is a very, uh, you know, it's your 100 thousand sure. foot look at the entire city and you're establishing goals for the entire city uh, these neighborhood plans are a zoom in a very focused look at a neighborhood in an area you're drilling down into specific issues that are being dealt with and trying to address those specific issues um, by that neighborhood so the way you improve areas um, and, and the way you implement it, there's really three ways, right? You've got your zoning, you've got your comprehensive plan, you've got your zoning ordinance, and you've got your, your CIP, right? So what this plan has done is it's kind of taken the existing comp plan, and I don't think you'll find anything in this plan that's contrary to your existing comp plan, or quite frankly, the, the new one when it's updated, right? And, but we've zoomed in uh, and we've identified, okay, through this plan, there might need to be some future land use map changes. And Rachel mentioned we would do that as part of the comp plan update. She mentioned some zoning ordinance changes, right? Yeah. So those are things that we can be working on. And then with this plan, and it's got the priorities, then we can start seeking funding through CIP, grants, CDBG, all, all of those things. But unless you have the plan, it's not on anyone's radar. Yeah. I don't disagree with any of that. Just other than the fact that you know, you you, you call them the ones that I was concerned about were, what are we going to do at the flume? Because you know, this, this one plan alone is a good example of getting off base from that, and then the zoning changes, which I thought would be, um, and specifically in this particular situation, as you talk about the row houses, Rachel, I start hearing the same echoes that we had. Gosh, I can't even remember the project where, um, you know, I believe it was in Cornerstone where they were trying to put up those essentially business slash residence um, buildings because there was some there was some definitional gray area, for lack of a better phrase. And I think the lesson I learned on that was I don't know how you'd fight it, but it's certainly something I'd want to think about on the front side, out of zoning. You know, ordinance situation as opposed to going, gosh, that's a big hole I never thought about. I don't know that this is bad. I just would like to have some time to think about it as opposed to react. So that was my only, that was my thought in, in the combination of the, or the way that would be incorporated into the comprehensive plan. I will say, because I think it's appropriate now. I can't tell you how impressed I was with the level of work that was done on this. I didn't realize that this was a totally inside. So, so any of the smoke that you think is blowing, I had not know that when I put these plans together, but or these comments together. But I just thought the depth of detail, the things that were talked about, the thought um, that was brought to it, and the thought that it, prov that it provoked in me—I I thought it was a fabulous, fabulous effort. I really thought. This was one of the best we've seen, and maybe it's because I can appreciate it more, but this is just good work. So you're being good. I agree. And did a good job. Yeah, I think each plan just gets better and better and more comprehensive, and it's good to see how well the public is participating in these. And I think that's building on, they see the previous ones and they see right. what's happening. Exactly. And they're like, now it's our turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I applaud you all. I, I do have one more specific question. Tom, you kind of raised this, but I think a, a, a neat part of this is being able to tie into the Blackwater Creek trails. And I'm looking at the maps and the topos, and you know, there's the Kemper Street extension, and then there's the, the dirt trail at, near the river. I'm just wondering more thoughts on that without having to cross through the neighborhoods. Or maybe that's okay to do that on how to how to get a a, a decent connection. Let me go down behind the hospital. Isn't that where it was going? <clears throat> um, are you talking about the Chamber Street Gateway where it 
connects to Kemper Street. That one. Then wasn't there one that went down behind Lynchburg General to that entrance? There, yeah, there's some there's some earth and trails that are there that are grown over, and they're on the map actually. Mm -hmm. And I've been on those. There's also paved trails that go down to the trail in different places. But I was that's why I was asking because I think connectivity is so important. Yeah to the hospital, to working people, and people who actually might not want to drive to work, but ride a bike. You know, you can't do that as well on an earthen trail sometimes. Right. And, and that might be more low-hanging fruit in terms mm -hmm. of costs. Right, it, sure. Especially if Parks and Rec were involved yeah. with that. I think the one, one thing I would say is, you know, just looking through here and seeing some of these pictures, you know, living on Rivermont to, um, to see the city right some wrongs or make an effort at that and, and at that level I think is really important. I think it's it's something that you you know when you walk around Riverside Park you see that too. Mm -hmm. And that's a I think a thing in history that you look at and it's it's not a, a proud moment for our city. So I really do appreciate that. I really wanted to acknowledge it and you know say what can we learn from that and how can we sort of recognize it as part of this neighborhood's history and integrate it into something more positive. Right. I don't think that's a benefit of having the neighborhood be so involved too. Because mm -hmm. I think that's a, you know, something that I always appreciated growing up. And I don't know that that's quite as true now. And I'd love to see that kind of stuff happen the Timbridge Hill effort, that kind of thing. I think it's powerful, and I think it's inspirational. Are there any other comments that any, anyone else want to weigh in on this? If not, We're I make be... a motion that we accept the resolution as presented. Okay. Or the plan as presented. Do that. What we'll, we'll be doing is voting to pass this on to city to city council. So is that a motion? That was a motion. Was a motion. Okay. Second it. All right. Well, then we'll go ahead. No other comments. We'll go into a vote. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Great. Well, thank you, Rachel. Again, this is this is a great a great thing to see, and um, like to see. Th I think things will move move. Sometimes they don't move as fast as we want, but. True. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see the courts already there. I, when you said that, I was like, yeah, you can. You're probably taking the picture from those, mm -hmm. from those stands and <laughs> looking yeah. over the court. Yeah, that so. one's not a rendering. <laughs> yeah. And you notice that as soon as you come around the bend. So yeah. It's cool. It's bright, yeah. Great. All right. Do we have any other business? Will we be having a meeting on the 28th? Yes. Be positive. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, problems. Sure. Okay. All right, well, anybody? I move to adjourn. Second. All right, well, I don't hear anybody opposing, so have a good afternoon. <laughs>